Hello, everyone. Welcome to the home of FIFA here in Zurich, the home of uh, world football, on the occasion of the 14th meeting of the FIFA Council, which was held via video conference. Before inviting FIFA President Gianni Infantino to make his opening remarks, I would like to provide you with some procedural information. This press conference is being live streamed to the general public via FIFA.com in four languages on four separate streams, in English, French, German and Spanish. In addition, accredited media have been invited to join this Zoom call and simultaneous interpretation has also been provided in the application in the aforementioned languages. We will open the press conference to questions in a few moments, but before then, I would like to pass the floor to the FIFA president, Gianni Infantino. Thank you very much, David. Um, welcome to all of you. Thanks for being present and for uh, uh, taking an interest in what we are doing. Let me just uh, start this uh, press conference uh, by um, just mentioning and, and paying tribute to uh, Diego Maradona, to a legend, to a giant, to somebody that definitely marked not only the history of football, but le really the legends and the fairy tales and everything that has to do with, uh, with football. Sadly, he's not anymore with us. It is um, also difficult for me to say and to speak about uh, Diego still, because uh, I think like many um, of, of you, We all love, I love Diego, and this will be forever. And um, I want to keep him, like everyone that loves football, in memories for uh, how he made us all fall in love with the game. He was really unique. And he is definitely eternal. Having said that, we uh, uh, celebrated a council meeting today, as you know, uh, council meeting number 14. It was a virtual meeting online, and we have uh, taken some uh, very, very important decisions. Because we passed, uh, indeed, landmark reforms for uh, female players and for coaches, and it is uh, Maybe surprising that these reforms are coming only now, but now they are coming. We have always to remember that the players are the protagonists of the game. They are the most important part of the game. We have to make sure that we set the stage for them to shine. And we want them, of course, to be healthy, to be safe, and uh, to be happy. And uh, when it comes to female players, this means that we should bring also more stability to their careers. So that, uh, for example, if they need to take uh, maternity leave, then they do not have to worry about their careers when they are ready to play again. We have introduced rules minimum standards at worldwide level that guarantee this. And if we are serious about uh, boosting the women's game, and we are serious about that, then we need, we need to look at all these aspects. As for the coaches as well, well, coaches are important, very important parts of the game as well. They are the ones uh, that develop how we play, and uh, that inspire the players. The coaches, too, they need uh, job security, and uh, we have established minimum standards for their employment conditions to protect coaches, to protect as well their clubs, to protect the associations hiring them. Job security, minimum standard clear 
rules. So as I said, uh, the players are the protagonists and uh, we are committed to protecting their health and their well-being. And uh, we are encouraged as well that uh, the medical committee of FIFA is moving to step up our efforts to deal with concussion as it has established a working group that uh, will advise on a more robust concussion strategy. Elsewhere, it has been uh, the theme of the year. We have had to adapt the international match calendar according to the COVID-19 situation, which is uh, sadly still with us. So we have extended uh, the international windows for both men and women's international match calendar to avoid bottlenecks in uh, the fixtures. The details of these extensions uh, uh, can be found in our press release, both for the men's uh, as well as for the women's international match calendar. Also, and still due to the COVID-19 situation, uh, which uh, has led to the postponement of uh, the revamped, the new club World Cup, which should have taken place in the summer of 2021 in China, uh, but which we did, agreed, of course, to postpone in order to make place for the Euro and the Copa America. Well, we have decided to organize a Club World Cup in the current format, again in 2021, in December, uh, and we awarded the hosting rights to Japan, Japan which has a long tradition, as you know, of hosting, of course, Club World Cups. In addition to this, we also had um, uh, to decide that the 71st FIFA Congress of next year will also be held online, as we did this year, instead of being able to hold it in uh, Tokyo as it was originally planned. The FIFA Congress is, uh, you know it, uh, you've been to many of them, is a big, big undertaking and uh, it takes a lot of planning as well. And uh, uh, we felt that it is appropriate still this year to do it online. We hope that will be the last time. Uh, finally, um, and as well importantly, of course, the Council has approved a regulatory amendment to allow the transfer of uh, players, of minor players aged between 16 and 18, between associations that are part of the same state. The prime example of that being, of course, the United Kingdom, so a player of 16 years uh, can move from Scotland uh, to Wales, um, obviously, uh, in this new uh, regulation that was uh, amended today. These were, in a nutshell, the main decisions we took, and uh, obviously I'm here to uh, answer or try to answer any question you might uh, have. Thank you, Jenny. The first one of those questions are upcoming. Graham Dunbar from the Associated Press. Graham, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I hope, hope you can hear me now. All good, Graham. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for having a, a press conference after an executive meeting. question uh, about the future international match calendar and how it might the negotiations you're I think going to start soon how they might be impacted by what the Champions League wants to do in um, reforms if it's correct it seems right that UEFA wants to add at least four more games to the Champions League how does that affect or limit the sort of scope you've got for what you want to do with mandatory player releases and fitting in the 2014 Club World Cup um, in future. I mean, if you can just update where you are with the post-24 calendar negotiations. And in terms of the POT system or the Swiss system, I mean, this has been available to you before, uh, Jani, both at UEFA before and again at FIFA. The offer hasn't been taken up yet. Can you explain why that, ha why that, why it hasn't been right to adopt that kind of system on any competition you've been involved in before? 
Uh, well, thanks, uh, Graham, for, for your question. Uh, well, the Swiss system applies in Switzerland, as far as I know, so it has been, <laughs> it has been applied somewhere, uh, if it's called the Swiss system. Yeah, but I don't know, I have to say, uh, and I don't want to speak about things I don't, I don't know. I don't know exactly what uh, proposals uh, are being uh, tabled. I've obviously been reading uh, a little bit uh, or been hearing about uh, some proposals, as you say, adding uh, some match days and so on. Obviously, everyone is is interested in uh, uh, making uh, his uh, own competitions uh, better and, 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 and stronger, and that is uh, certainly uh, legitimate. So is, is FIFA as well. I mean, FIFA is the world governing body. It is normal that we focus on um, uh, the FIFA competitions, that we focus on giving clubs, uh, in addition to national teams all over the world, uh, the possibility to compete more and uh, uh, in more exciting competitions. Now, I said it already, I think this is the time where we need to uh, sit down, where we need to discuss, where we need to debate. Uh, we were obviously more busy in the last year now to uh, take some short-term decisions on the current international match calendar. But, uh, you know, some, uh, some of the events that uh, had to happen in this, in this period um, such as, for example, more international games in a shorter period or final eight tournaments or whatever uh, in Asia, in Europe, have shown that maybe there are other models that, that indeed we can and we should at least discuss and think about. There is no negotiation, as you call it, uh, taking place so far. Uh, we are still at the brainstorming uh, phase, and I think that's certainly my wish there should be no taboos in, in addressing um, any proposal and any issue. And then we will see where this, uh, where this leads us. What I think is that uh, we should think about sometimes, um, you know, less being more. We decided, and that's probably a unique in the last, I don't know how many decades of history of certainly football organizations, uh, we decided to abolish a competition, the Confederations Cup. Um, we decided to reform a Club World Cup, all in all together, reducing the number of uh, games. Uh, and um, that could be uh, certainly a model we think to follow. It is important, though, to always protect national teams as well. Every football fan is fan of a club, maybe a club of his country and maybe one of these big global clubs, uh, but also fan of his own country of his own national team and we have always to try to find the right balance and I understand and I've been in this like you for uh, many years now and I know that the discussions will be heated and that everyone as I said will defend his own interests and his own competitions and everyone wants to have more but we are not in a first come first served basis and the responsibility of FIFA in this respect will be to develop football on a global basis. Developing football on a global basis doesn't mean protecting uh, current situations. It means discussing about how we can improve current situations for everyone, but also how we can improve them in the rest of the world. So I think we'll have some exciting discussions in the months ahead, uh, because as you said, the calendar that we have ends in uh, 24. This means that by 21, uh, we need to have a new calendar in place. Uh, and I would say even by mid-21, um, possibly, so that everyone can plan for the future. And we will see how we can bring in the necessary uh, breaks. But uh, I'm confident that uh, um, we can come to something uh, good for global football. Thanks, Graeme. Next question comes from Reuters, Brian Homewood. Brian, the floor is yours. Hello, Brian. Sorry about that. Welcome, Brian. Again. We got you. Thanks. Uh, hi, Gianni. Sorry about that. Um, there seems to be a lot of concern amongst 
players and coaches at the moment about the number of fixtures being played this season and the, the risk of injury is getting greater and there was no real summer break to speak of and we now we're cramming more matches in uh, the same number of matches into a shorter period i just wondered if if you share these concerns if you agree that players are being pushed too hard at the moment and do you think there is a solution this season to to reduce the num maybe reduce the number of matches because at the moment nobody wants to think it seems that nobody really wants to cut down on the number of fixtures they're organizing Yes, thanks very much, uh, Brian, for, for your questions. And, and I think, uh, I mean, yeah, you, you're right. Obviously, nobody wants to cut anything. Uh, we did it. Uh, we showed a little bit the example, but uh, we want also to do something, um, something positive. Now, I understand, of course, uh, your remarks about uh, the number of, of games being played. And uh, I think we have all to understand here that uh, we need to... Uh, uh, as I said before, protect global football. Um, protecting the players, protecting the clubs, protecting the national teams. Trying to find and to strike the right balance is not easy. Um, and that's why we had to come with, with some uh, rules and with a detailed um, protocol, a protocol that tries, obviously, uh, and has done to a great extent protect the health of the players, which is the most important that uh, we need to care about, the health of the players. We have also, um, and I have to thank IFAB for that, decided, as you know, to introduce uh, for the time being the possibility to substitute five players instead of only three. And this goes also a little way in, um, um, in that direction. And you know we have to we have to think uh, on the future, taking as well you know what happened in the last uh, few months is as a learning on how we can um, make things better. I mean, I give you I give you just one example. You know the effect of playing some na more national team games in a, in a shorter uh, period of time is maybe a way to look into how we can reduce travel of players, which is also bringing um, uh, some uh, questions of fatigue. But we need to bear in mind that we cannot just uh, uh, take into account the interests of one stakeholder or of one party. Uh, we cannot uh, kill national team football. We cannot kill the countries. We cannot kill the clubs. We cannot kill the players, obviously not. And uh, we are now in a, how can I call it, in a, in a risk management modus where we have to try to do our best to protect everyone, to learn from uh, the experience, to try to change things. You know, I would like just to give you uh, one example as well uh, of a reduction because you said nobody uh, wants to reduce. Well, a long time ago when... Uh, when I was in UEFA, UEFA decided to reduce the number of games of the Champions League from 17 to 13. Um, and uh, this was also criticized by some who wanted maybe to see more games. Uh, but the result was that actually the competition became better and the revenues as well went up. So it is sometimes possible to, uh, to do that. But I think it is important to realize that we are not, as I was saying before, in a, in a first come, first served uh, business here. We are in a football um, business, in the football uh, uh, mindset, and we need to discuss these things openly between us, between all the stakeholders, see what can be the best ideas that can come up, maybe even with new competition formats that we had not thought about before, but that seem to work, and um, and then hopefully come up with uh, good solutions that uh, protect all stakeholders. But uh, I understand it's a long way, and at the end of the day, it will be up to FIFA to take its responsibility and and take uh, decisions. Hopefully, the decision will be shared with uh, with everyone by then. Next question comes from the Financial Times. Morad Ahmed, Morad, please. 
Uh, hi, Gianni. Thanks for doing this. Um, just a couple of quick questions. I, I noticed what you said about keeping the same format for the Club World Cup next year and hosting it in Japan. Um, apologies if I missed it, though. Do you plan to have your expanded Club World Cup in China, as previously agreed? And if so, when will that be? And also, related to that, um, you had a tender out, FIFA had a tender out for investors or commercial media partners for the expanded new Club World Cup. Are you retracting that tender now, or is that no longer on the agenda, seeking new investment for the tournament? Not at all. Uh, we, are, uh, um, we, had we have decided to postpone that tournament, um, but the tournament is very well uh, still on, uh, on the agenda. We just have not yet decided when uh, it, will, uh, it will take place. Uh, so the new Club World Cup or Club World Championship or whatever uh, it, it will be called, which is a, a tournament that, uh, you know, uh, especially clubs want and fans of clubs all over the world want as well is something that is, is very much there. Now, obviously, when it comes to the commercial side of that, um, of that tournament, uh, this is obviously a little bit on hold because uh, we need to be able to say when it will take place and uh, uh, it will take place in China, but when this is something that needs to be decided and when this decision will be taken, uh, then uh, we are confident and, and uh, uh, sure that uh, also the commercial part will follow and will be very um, successful. Let's not forget, though, what I have been saying already before, I mean, it's that when it comes to the commercial revenues of that tournament, 100% of that will go back to football. It is not about FIFA, um, it is about football. And I would like to take this opportunity as well to stress once more one thing that is maybe not really present to uh, um, everyone, at least I've not, never been reading about that, uh, is that if we take um, a national league or if we take a continental competition, they are commercializing their competitions, obviously, rightfully. They are generating revenues. Some of them are generating, I don't know, four, five, six times more revenues than what FIFA is generating. And uh, they distribute these revenues to a very limited number of clubs or stakeholders or national associations, which is their respective group. So a national league typically would distribute its revenues to his own clubs, and then maybe a little amount to solidarity for other clubs in the same country. A continental competition would distribute the big amount to the clubs participating from that continent in that competition, and a little amount of solidarity within that uh, continent. FIFA is the only organization in football in the world which is uh, investing, distributing all its revenues all over the world. So whatever we do in terms of uh, competitions in terms of income generation is going all over the world. Now, if we all are serious in saying that football is global and that there are uh, fans of clubs um, all over the world, well, then I think it is the minimum we can do to do something where football in the entire world can benefit as well um, of that. And uh, uh, you know, I am sure that the new FIFA Club World Cup will become the best club competition in the world. Uh, I'm also not uh, objective when I say that. I'm the president of FIFA, uh, but uh, I'm sure it will be uh, it will be big, uh, and it will develop club football immensely. And there will be a very important solidarity and football development part, which will go to the entire world, which today is something that is not happening in the way it should be happening. Thank you. Next question comes from the New York Times. Tariq Panja. Tariq, please. Hi, Gianni. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Very good. Yeah. 
Thank you. Just we published this week um, a story about a troubling story inside the French Football Federation uh, at Clairefontaine, where a um, trainer or uh, player education um, assistant sent inappropriate messages to a 13 year old boy eight years ago. This man has continued to work in football with children for eight years since until um, this month. The Federation said it couldn't do anything. It claimed to have um, carried out a full investigation. We spoke to um, 10 of these young men who said no one has ever spoken to them. Will you be following that up? Will you be asking the French Football Federation? Obviously, this is the federation that's given us the current world champions and Claire Fontaine is, is held up as one of the best academies in the world. Would FIFA be asking some questions about that? That was my first question. And just secondly, um, one of your uh, former uh, senior officials, Luis Vicente, as recently as this week, said he, he advocated as a, a, um, a, a breakaway league for, for the top European team, saying they're just too big. They're just different from, from the rest of uh, the clubs in world football. Do you think there is any merit in that? Thank you very much. Thank you, Tariq, uh, for, for your questions. Um, well, let me say that uh, obviously I cannot speak in, on, on, on individual cases, um, um, also uh, not having the knowledge of, of these cases. But what I can say is that uh, at FIFA we take uh, all cases of uh, sexual abuse very, very seriously. We have a zero tolerance policy about that. We have been uh, doing that now for, um, for a while. These are complicated situations sometimes in, 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 in certain countries that happened. The Ethics Committee, of course, is doing its own part. They are independent. They are doing their investigations. They are taking uh, their sanctions and their measure, measures when it happens. In addition to that, we had in certain places uh, to help concretely um, some of the victims uh, to take them, help them leave the country, protect their family, families, uh, to leave the country as well. Uh, these are all things that uh, we are doing uh, because we want to not tolerate at all any case of sexual abuse. Now, it might be easier to say uh, or not to speak about that because, uh, yeah, you know, it's, these are topics that can uh, put some shadow on the game, but we have to do that. We have to do that very seriously. We were uh, probably also there, one of the first sports federations, certainly the first football federation to introduce at the international level a program, a FIFA, the, what we call the FIFA Guardian program, where we gave some advice um, and support to our member associations in dealing with these matters because as you can imagine, in some countries, it's not that easy to deal with questions like that. In other countries, there are institutions uh, in place, governmental institutions or others, which help and assist. In some countries around the world, this does simply not exist. So we need to be present there. We need to guide uh, the associations to take um, the right measures. And uh, one of the proposals that I made in uh, September as well at our Congress, um, and uh, we discussed about it, for example, with the uh, United Nations Agency on Drugs and Crimes, that uh, we should really set up a new international intersport agency to deal with exactly these matters, not only about football, when you have children, and even when you don't have children, you want that your children can do sport in a safe environment. Now we know that sadly, you have children in a dressing room or, and you have sick people, and these things, terrible, terrible things are happening, but we need to tackle them. Now we are sports federations, we have some limits in terms of what we can investigate, how we can investigate, but if we set up, together with governments, together with intergovernmental associations, together with sports federations, a bit similar to what has been done for doping matter. A new agency who can investigate abuse, who can take measures dedicated exclusively to that. 
This is something that I feel we should not put under the carpet, we should not hide. It's something that we should embrace and that we should do because we owe it to all children who want to make sports. So we are working um, on that and I hope that, uh, that uh, we can uh, see some, um, some results. That was the first question, the second was the breakaway, the breakaway league. Well, <laughs> I, I think many, <laughs> many people say many things uh, on these things. What I said already uh, about it, I can happily repeat it. Uh, you know, I'm interested as FIFA president in, uh, when it comes to club matters, in uh, uh, the new revamped Club World Cup, which will be the best competition in the world. All other topics are topics that are raised, that are brought forward, that are uh, discussed every time for different reasons by different persons, um, and that are part of the debate of football. Uh, and actually, if you look at the history of how some leagues, some national leagues, have been created, well, they were also breakaway leagues to some extent. Uh, and then they have been, of course, uh, integrated in, in uh, the national system, in the international system, and so on and so forth. So, you know, there will always be discussions. Uh, uh, people will always say what, what they want to say. Uh, you have things to write. But we care about club football in the world, and uh, we will have the best club competition in the world in FIFA. <laughs> Time for two further questions. Penultimate question to the Times, Martin Ziegler. Martin, the floor is yours. Hello, Martin. Martin, we try and come back to you in a, in a couple of moments. Um, so the penultimate question now transfers to somebody else. Geraint Hughes from Sky Sports News. Geraint, the floor is now yours. Hi, can you hear me, Johnny? Yep. Johnny, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Great stuff. Thanks very much. Um, just a question. Uh, today you probably should have had Greg Clark, the former FA chairman, sitting alongside you or virtually speaking to you at the council meeting. Just how disappointed were you when you heard his remarks to British MPs last month? And also, what confidence, what reassurances can you give to those that are looking for greater inclusion, greater diversity within football, that FIFA is listening to those calls and has the right people in senior positions to bring that confidence? Well, thanks. Uh... Uh, for for uh, for the question, and um, obviously I have to state uh, uh, or to start by stating that um, uh, and repeating um, that FIFA has a zero tolerance policy here as well on discrimination. Uh, this is clear. Any form any form of uh, discrimination, whether it's racism, sexism, homophobia, has no place in football. No place on the pitch. No place out of the pitch. Has no place whatsoever in football. So, um, in the, the circumstances and, of course, given the nature of his comments, we consider that uh, Greg Clark did the right thing in uh, uh, resigning as FA chairman and then also, obviously, as FIFA vice president. Uh, we, uh, of course, on a personal level, I'm, I'm sad about it. I'm sad about the remarks and I'm sad about the consequences, but obviously uh, um, this was what had to be done uh, and he took the right decision to, uh, to step down. We have to fight discrimination and racism and we are, I think, doing that in FIFA as well. We are doing that in FIFA in a very concrete uh, way uh, when you look, for example, only at the FIFA administration, where uh, in the past the whole management was coming maybe from one or two countries 
uh, in uh, Switzerland and around Switzerland. Now we have uh, basically the entire world present. We have women present in our management team in the FIFA administration. We have women, I think it's five out of 15. It's enough? No, it's not enough, but we need to do always more. We have more women in the FIFA Council. Is enough? No, but we need to show the example. We uh, have reduced the number of FIFA committees from 24 to 9. I'll just give you these examples to show you concretely what we try to do. From 24 committees to 9, now every one of you, when, when you want to say something a bit critical about FIFA, I say, well, these committees, they are, just, they are there to please people. Um, uh, well, we reduce the number of committees, but we increase the number of women representation from 4% to uh, uh, over 20% in these committees. So we try uh, to do something. We introduced uh, the three-step process in terms of the referees on the pitch. We have uh, at um, disciplinary level when nothing helps anymore, uh, measures that uh, are taken in order to uh, fight against discrimination. But I think the most important uh, point that we need to tackle is to raise the awareness, is to speak about it. It's like for the topic that I was saying before about, about the sexual abuse. We have to talk about it. We don't, don't have to talk it down. We don't have to hide it. We don't have to say uh, it's part of society and that's why it's also part of football and, you know, yeah, we try to do something. No, we have to sense how you say, sensibilize, sensibilize, I don't know, it doesn't exist probably in English, that word, but to create the sensitivity in the people by speaking about it and by trying to educate people. I think that football is an incredible tool and we are launching uh, a, a program with our foundation which is called Football for Schools because education in our schools as well is the key and football is a tool to bring people together in football people are part of a team are part of an event at grassroots level at youth level at senior level at professional level it doesn't matter but you are part of a community and you learn to respect you learn many things and um, that's why i think we need to always um, banging on these uh, topics to never be complacent about it and uh, to obviously uh, try with actions and with facts and not just with words as we did in uh, the FIFA administration, for example, with actions and with facts show that you know, we are different, not only um, because we are all different, but that this difference is also inclusive and we bring and try to bring everyone on board. This is not easy. Huh? It's not easy because out of the 211 associations, just to give you one example, there are only three women who are uh, presidents of, of a maze. So it would be much easier for a FIFA president uh, to please men rather than women. We don't have to please neither men nor women, but we have to be inclusive. We have to be inclusive, we have to believe in what we say, and nobody can object to that. And that's why we continue in this, uh, uh, in this direction. Uh, final question of this press conference goes to Martin Ziegler of the Times. Martin, I do have your question if you are still on mute. So first opportunity is to you, second opportunity well, is to you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I got you loud and clear. Is it, can you hear me now? Yeah, got you. Ah, great. Hey, Johnny, I just, um, I know uh, Alexander Sheffer, the new race president, uh, wrote to you about um, the offside issues on VARs and the Premier League of... Uh, They've also raised um, problems with IFAB, saying that this, this sort of very, very marginal offside calls um, and handball issues, both of these are, are things that are, uh, I think Sheffield was a handball issue. But the whole issue of VAR, it looks like it's coming under the microscope and it, it seems to be a lot of players are coming out saying it's damaging football as well. But what's your view on this? Hi, Martin. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Well, I think that VAR uh, is helping football. It's certainly not damaging football. Um, I think also that uh, we have to remember that VAR was introduced for the first time two years ago, not 200 years ago, or, you know, 20 years ago. And uh, 
we don't have to uh, make a confusion between uh, VAR and maybe sometime wrong decisions which are taken because of uh, uh, the wrong way in which VAR is used, maybe in some places, uh, because the lack of experience of those who are using VAR. Uh, let's not forget that this is, this is really a landmark change for a referee who uh, uh, you know, was used and has made all these referees who are using VAR, they didn't grow up with VAR. So let's not forget that. It's not, it's not that easy. Now, what we have to do, of course, is to take the pulse of what is, what is happening uh, out there, to take the criticisms, to analyze them. And for this, we have experts. I would not dare myself to, uh, certainly not to call myself an expert on these matters, uh, but also to uh, give uh, um, more input than bringing these experts together, whether refereeing experts, players, coaches, and so on, who are in these panels discussing and trying to find the best uh, ways forward to adapt if uh, the rules need to be adapted, uh, the laws of the game for the future and making proposals to IFAB in this respect. I think there we are in, in good hands. We have to trust that the people are doing uh, a good job. Uh, you know, let me say as well that VAR is not an obligation. It's there to help. Those who don't want to use it, they are not obliged to use it. That's also true. Uh, so we are not obliging anyone. It helped certainly the referees in the World Cup, to speak only about FIFA competitions. It helps the referees in many competitions, uh, and players and coaches agree. Uh, obviously, uh, you speak about marginal offside. Uh, well, you know, the question there is uh, not about VAR, it's about the law. Because a marginal offside is also an offside. Even if it's marginal, it's an offside. And there, you see as well different cultures. In, 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 in some cultures, you say marginal offside, yeah, why? That's, I mean, it's just marginal, it's just a little bit offside, so you, you should let him go and score. In other countries, in other cultures, people say, ah, this is a fantastic decision. Thanks to VAR, we have seen even such a small offside. But this has brought what? This has brought the discussion about the offside rule. The offside rule, which has evolved over the last 100 years and which we are discussing, uh, Arsene Wenger, Pierluigi Collina, and so on, are debating. Um, and uh, we are looking at if we can make the offside rule better, not because of VAR, but because we want to foster offensive football. So the question is, should we give more advantage uh, to, the, to, the, to the attacking football, to the attacking players, which is how the offside rule has evolved over the years. And this would then help as well that uh, uh, there are no more marginal offsides, because when it's offside, then it's really, you know, a player has to be really in front of uh, the other, at least with a part of his body that scores a goal. So these are, these are discussions which are currently held, and it's interesting to see in these discussions that you have uh, uh, usually uh, split views and opinions. Uh, the strikers and midfielders are very favorable to having a more, um, uh, how shall I say, open offside rule. Um, the goalkeepers and defenders are a little bit more worried about that. But this is part of the game, and we have introduced new governance structures also in IFAB to deal with these questions that are now dealt with, and, and we look into that. Same, similarly for, uh, for the handball uh, rule, uh, for which maybe uh, in the past uh, there was less scrutiny, and uh, uh, now there is more scrutiny, but the rules and the interpretation of the rules, which was given already in the past uh, to the referees, has not really changed uh, too much, nevertheless. It's analyzed, it's reanalyzed, and uh, uh, the technical and the football advisory panels of IFAB will certainly make some proposals on these two areas uh, in view of the next IFAB meeting, um, the beginning of, uh, of next year, and the annual meeting on the 16th, I think, of December. Uh, there is more to come. 
That concludes today's press conference. Thank you for your questions. Thanks also for your answers and for the interpretation. A date for your diary, 19th of March 2021, the next FIFA Council meeting. Until then, goodbye from the home of FIFA.